Um, just a disclosure I have to make, um, I do not represent any company in making this presentation. Up till Friday I was working for Twitter and I have an interesting new role but this is presented on behalf of Tim Hoffman, unemployed bum. <laughs> anyway, so in the, my, the first networking job I had in my career, gone 12 years ago now, um, we built a nationwide carrier for under a million dollars. And this was done in a time in New Zealand where there were two telcos with fiber between the cities. And both telcos were unwilling to offer WDM services. And you'd essentially be paying in the order of you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars for 100 meg to you know, multi-gig services between um, towns that were close to each other. The market was fundamentally broken with a duopoly. And I went to work in my first telco job at this company that was founded by a guy called Roger DeSalis. And his aim was essentially to, to disrupt this market and get it to the point where ISPs could provide affordable services to their users that actually had some capacity behind them. And we were really just trying to change the price by moving away from over-engineered solutions to something that worked and provided what people needed. Eventually we got funding from a guy called Colin who found civil works more interesting than network and funded as such. So it's very easy to build fiber and very hard to buy network equipment. And Colin had a rare, a, a rare thing where he made decisions by talking to his Labrador retriever, including if you Google it, you can find that he decided to sponsor a racing team at one point by talking to his Labrador retriever. So it was an interesting company. So um, we actually built a network, obviously the fiber cost more than a million dollars, but the, we built 56 pops and a resilient nationwide network for under a million. And we did it through a lot of creative engineering, and there were some interesting war stories to go along with it. So to set the scene, I'm going to share my favorite fiber build picture ever. And we're going to sh set, um, share a bunch of stories as to how we did this. But firstly, I want to make a disclaimer. FX got acquired in 2014, and there's someone in the audience called Dimitro who works for Lynx now. And um, you can talk to him about how much of this network is left, but essentially they've refurbished this network since as Vocus bought it and then have redeployed their own equipment throughout it. So none of the horrors you're going to see here are still in production. So we didn't have a lot of money to spend and we didn't have a lot of staff. And we didn't have the, you know, the engagements you get in the UK or the US where you have resident engineers falling all over you to help you out. We had a lot of tight deadlines. So we had to be really creative as to how we built this. So let's start with our transmission network. When you build a transmission network, you might think you'd build a WDM system. We found a thing called an APCON, and an APCON is a layer one repeater, and it's pictured on the top right there. But essentially, we back-to-back -back ZR optics over 80 plus kilometer spans to build our first transmission network. And every 10 gig we would lay across the country, we'd put another 20 of these APCONs that would then enable us to build capacity up and down New Zealand. And what we found is that actually if you picked the right optics, an 80 kilometer ZR optic could actually cover up to a 93 kilometer span. And what we were actually doing to select POPs was we drove up and down State Highway 1 in New Zealand, which goes the length of New Zealand, and um, just picked some convenient locations that we thought could be good places to put POPs and people might buy it. So the challenge was that you'd be told that you had a 70 kilometer span, and you'd be like, okay, that's on the edge of where you might be able to deliver. And then some fiber statistics would come back and some measurements and they'd be saying, well, look, we're thinking it's probably more like 81. Is that okay? And you'd be like, oh, we could probably do that if we select the right optics. And then at the end, all said and done with a few splices and a few you know, diverting around bridges and streams, you'd find it was a 93 kilometer span. So we still managed to make everything work, but we had special ZRs um, in our spares that were the well-performing ZRs and the non-well-performing ZRs. And what we found is if you swapped the ZRs out every year, then the burn down of the lasers wouldn't affect you too badly. <laughs> then what we can also see here is one of, is one of my favorite pictures on the bottom right, which is um, what we call bro location, which we're gonna get more into in a sec, which is our original racks, which were um, things stacked on filing cabinets and other bits and pieces. And you know, being a part of the Pacific Rim and, not, and susceptible to earthquakes, we felt this was a very secure way to build a network. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, this is actually a, a railway hut we built a pop in. Eventually we moved to a more reliable form of you know, not having your pop fall over in an earthquake. Um, and we couldn't afford any optical testing equipment. So we actually had a Cisco 6504, which is pictured on the left there, which we wheeled around between pops. And we bought, had one, we had these two optics that were DOM capable, and we used that as our fiber testing equipment before deploying it in production. 
Um, and um, you know, if we actually had to do any OTDR testing, we would get a contractor. So you can kind of build a picture as to how cheap we did this. Um, our transmission network looked like this in the end, and this is probably a year into it, we actually did deploy a bit of DWDM because um, a couple of our customers started to want higher capacity circuits. Um, but essentially this was all a collapsed ring, initially on one piece of fiber up and down the country. But we built it so that while well, the fiber could fail, um, nothing else would, and any failure of equipment would be okay. So we actually only had seven PEs in the network, and we had a loop-free topology that would allow us to plumb circuits to a couple of PEs at e on either side and ensure we could provide a resilient service through providing multiple services. In terms of power, we had an interesting adventure there. And what we discovered was that none of us had electrical licenses. So we had to do creative things because we couldn't afford an electrician. So we found that um, we found some SNMP controllers that could activate um, relays and it could act like relays, so we could control a lot of our power systems via that. But we also found that three KVA UPSs could be serviced without an electrician. So we fundamentally set out to build a solution that didn't require a Sparky at any point. And you know, we did have to obviously get a Sparky and some contractors for the generators, but we found that you could actually put 500 litres of diesel in any site in New Zealand without getting, a, um, getting registered. So we had these sites that were built with incredibly low power requirements that could actually run for three weeks without power in some of the more remote places in New Zealand. And there's some roads that uh, if anyone who's been to New Zealand may have experienced in New Zealand that go for a couple of hundred kilometres that we had to put a pop in the middle of where power will fail for a couple of weeks at a time. Which actually was interesting because getting access to those sites became a lot easier when you could offer them power for their heater during the power failures and you could just build on the side of someone's house. And again, I think what we would call these is bro location facilities in terms of the quality we had, but we built enough of them and enough diversity that we had, div uh, enough, enough of them that we had diversity via having multiple things that would fail regularly. And then finally, the thing we discovered was that both in terms of power usage and in terms of our, um, our cost basis, you could actually get away if you spaced your racks correctly throughout the pops with not having any air conditioning, which meant that during a failure, you weren't, um, you weren't burning your, your diesel down to power an air conditioner, but also made your cost of delivery a lot cheaper. And then we've got some more photos here of the power systems we built. So we actually, one of the best things we ever did was that every um, piece of equipment got connected to one of these um, manual transfer switches. And you know, because it was manual, there was actually very little that could go wrong. And we'd connect one leg to a UPS and one leg to mains. So anytime we wanted to service a UPS, we could just flick the power over without interrupting the equipment. And I'd say this because we were not able to afford dual power supplies in our networking equipment. So we had to be very careful as to how we juggled these things around. And once in a while, you know, in a couple of sites we didn't do this, we actually had to bring a second power supply to the device, put it in temporarily so we could do power work on the other side. Anyway, so just wrapping up the co-location, I think the um, final thing we learned in co-location was don't give your master key out too much. So we had these 56 pops and a founder who eventually didn't work for the company. And the challenge we had with the founder was that he actually in, ended up trying to build some of his own fiber network um, through, with our assets just by entering the pops and plugging everything between different points and pits. <laughs> and we discovered this once we actually had an outage where he unplugged the wrong cable and then it all came out that he was uh, actually trying to do some other, some other things and it got a little bit interesting. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of the colo sites because there's some amazing war stories here in terms of um, some of the things we did. So the first is the Wellington Railway Station. And Wellington is the capital of New Zealand and probably one of the most susceptible to earthquakes. So one of the rules they had in the back of this railway station where they had this mini data center was that you had to have isobase, which is essentially a system where you know, your racks can rock um, in an earthquake. And we didn't really want to pay the money for the isobase racks. So we went to a metalworking shop that a friend had and we um, got some rub big rubber bands and made our own isobase that we could put together in order to meet this requirement, which they grudgingly signed off. But the challenge here was what we found is this is one of the sites we didn't control our generator. And what we found is actually controlling your generator is really, really important. And we had a few more outages than the other sites here because the power was actually pretty unreliable and because they tried to hook a supermarket or a grocery store inside the railway station to this generator and overwhelm the amount of power the generator could provide. 
And the final war story from this site is that um, New Zealand's primary 911 call centre um, had a, a backup circuit we were selling them. But the challenge was that we kept giving people non-rate limited services. So if you bought a 1 gig service, we'd just give you a 10 gig service anyway. Um, because we, d we didn't believe in rate limits, because it was actually cheaper to buy equipment that couldn't support it. So anyway, the, we ended up giving the police these backup cir circuits that they started using as their primary, because they were much faster. And, but it was single home, and we had to move this PE one night. So we actually managed to move a Cisco uh, 7606 up, I think, 12 rack units, while all 911 traffic in New Zealand was going through it. <laughs> All right, and on to a, a potentially a more, a more or less interesting um, site. We, um, as we were driving up and down State Highway 1, setting up our initial network, we discovered that there would be a power station. And um, my colleague Daniel Griggs, I remember, t tell us that he thought it would be a really good idea and really reliable power if we just put the pop inside the power station. So we actually did, and it was very, very reliable. It was very hard to get in there. There's a photo of um, a few of the engineers there getting their electrical licenses to enter the power station. Um, but um, what we found is that once the equipment was there, it would, the power would never fail. And this is, this is an, another interesting one. In Hunterville, we um, real, found a cafe that was trying to figure out what to do with this bank vault from this bank they'd bought, which they turned into a cafe. And so we went and put our equipment, and this is our generator behind the vault in the cafe, in the, in the vault, and used that as our pop. But I think this is the most interesting one. Um, what you can see on the bottom here is um, our standard um, pop bunker that we dropped about 30 of around the country. And what we had is this pop essentially had room for four racks plus a separate generator room in this bunker that cost $10,000. So you could drop them anywhere you wanted and just get a power hookup and you were away. Um, and what was great about this is that so, in so much of New Zealand there's actually a lot of space around so you could build your pops really easily where there might not have been a, a good environment to do it but you weren't spending the money to build a, a whole building, it was cheap. Anyway, this one is a bit interesting because our founder told us that he would definitely got permission from the New Zealand army to use their land. <laughs> not so much. And that turned into an interesting negotiation after we had um, had the pop running for a year and the army started asking questions as to why there was this building on their land. <laughs> Behind that building is actually a New Zealand army testing, um, testing range where they tested shooting tanks in bits and pieces. And then finally, the one that anyone who's done networking in New Zealand will remember, oh, actually second to finally, because there's a better one after this, is the Sky Tower. So if anyone, um, if anyone knows what the Sky Tower is, it's a 50-story uh, building. It's the tallest building in New Zealand and one of the tallest in the Southern Hemisphere. And the 48th floor is, was where most of New Zealand's internet went through for a solid 10 years. And what this all originated from was that New Zealand's internet started with radio. So from this tower, you could see all of Auckland. Then what happened was all of the carriers built their network hubs in there, and then as fibre um, fiber started to be more of a thing, everyone interconnected there. And the reason they all did this was that there, were no, there was no charge for cross-connects, and there was a reason. The cross-connects were an absolute mess. So you could go up to Sky Tower and run your own cross-connect between racks, as everyone did, and the thing became an absolute mess. But the bigger challenge there was that it could reach 50 degrees Celsius in summer, and the power was unreliable. So you would have these regular power outages where you would see all of these fat systems administrators running 50 floors up <laughs> to try and get up this building, which I'm sure Richard Patterson has done from time to time. He'll be somewhere in the audience there. Um, and so we ended up trying to keep minimal edge equipment in there because the whole place was a disaster. And in the end, everyone moved out from there into a building called 220 Queen, which was also free cross connects Slightly better run, but on a floodplain. So we definitely improved the reliability of New Zealand's internet. And then finally, this is probably the most epic pop situation after the Christchurch earthquake. Um, we had a pop that was on top of the TVNZ building in Christchurch. And it was actually a great building. You could do a good radio shop from it. It was like a bunker on top of the roof. Um, access was a pain because there was two levels of, pe of leasing going on. So you had to get a lot of approvals to get up there. But during the Christchurch earthquake, the building ended up looking like this. The challenge was the pop still worked. So we had all of these production circuits, again including the police, working um, out of this pop, and no one had any idea how long the generator would last. 
So there was this mad rush to migrate all of these services out of this pop into another one before um, the power stopped working, because obviously no one was going to go into that building. Um, all right, and onto the fiber we built. So um, one of the things we learned a surprising amount about, about was civil works as we built this network. And there were some pretty cool things like big rock saws and you know, trenches that could run along dig, um, digging holes. And initially we were trying to do it as cheap as, and fast as possible. So we actually buried without any conduit, which is probably the worst mistake one could ever make. In that in the end when we had a bunch of fiber parts with conduit on them and a bunch of parts that weren't through conduit, you found that the ones that didn't have conduit got about five times as many fiber cuts. Additionally, the challenge we ran into is if you're just direct burying your fiber, if you hit a challenging piece of um, the road, you have to stop. So let's say you're um, burying along and you hit some rock, you have to stop and then you have to get a piece of equipment to your site and then get them to cut through that and you keep going. Whereas with conduit, you can just lay pieces of conduit and then connect them all together at the end. And then you can actually blow the fiber through the conduit. And I know that everyone does this now, but 10, 12 years ago, this was pretty revolutionary to be able to actually blow fiber through the conduit and, um, you know, and feed it through later. But, um, and Daniel Griggs actually gave a great presentation on how we did this at PACNOG 7, which actually has some fantastic photos of the machinery we used to do this, and some of the methodologies driving up and down roads to find pops, etc. So our original network was just five PEs. It was a bunch of Cisco 7600s, and it actually expanded over time to 40 PEs. But in the first place, most pops would just have a switch that took us back to a couple of PEs, and we essentially ran a bunch of routers on a stick. And the idea was that we had some switches that provided the actual network, and then the routers on a stick were just to route around damage. But we would always give you two services if you bought one, because we essentially figured that if we gave you two services and set the expectation that one could fail at any time, you'd be in a happier place as a customer. And you've got to bear in mind we were selling to ISPs. We ran everything as a loop-free topology, and um, what we did is we never gave anyone a rate limit. So even if you bought a 500 meg service, we would sell you in port speed increments because that would enable us not to have, buy, have to buy cards that actually um, would allow you to do rate limits because they were more expensive. And the idea we had was to run all versions of code in a really simple configuration. We had a pretty even mix of point-to-point -point and transit services, but the, we actually separated it quite interestingly in that we had a backbone that just ran layer two point-to-point and then we had a separate ISP that bought services off the backbone. And this enabled us to do what I call 7201 scaling, and that it's a surprising how far you can scale an ISP on horizontally distributed Cisco 7201s. And the most complex thing we actually did was that in New Zealand, the cost of international at the time um, I st we started was about $1,000 a megabit, whereas the cost of domestic capacity was pretty cheap. So we ended up um, moving to a model where we sold them at quite different rates and differentiated the products quite hard. So the one place we did actually shape was here. We didn't have a knock, we just had five engineers and one manager. If you call up, you'd um, talk to an engineer. And we had a really simple set of services to do this. We never supported VPLS or L3VPM, and we made failure easy on ourselves by again selling dual services wherever we could. And this actually enabled us to get to the point where even though we had about 50 ISPs as customers, we were getting one to two knock calls a week, so which was fantastic because everyone just found it easy. In terms of access, we used a lot of radio. At that time, there was no um, way to purchase fiber um, d d and within most metros. There were two metros that had it, and everywhere else was, um, was, was just non-existent or not commercially available. So people could come and bring their own tail and um, screw a radio to the top of our pop and we would throw them some power and an ethernet cable and if they wanted to get to us. Or we had a couple of partners that would do radio shots to your building. And in this, we had to learn to debug and reverse engineer really well. So we had a server at every pop, we could do TCP dumps. And actually, if you logged a fault and complained about your service, we would just um, dump um, a couple of um, servers into your service and do an iperf across it. Because one of the biggest challenges in New Zealand was at the time, no one really understood how to optimize um, for long, fat pipes. And as we all know, having a one gig service doesn't necessarily mean that if you haven't tuned your network stack, you'll actually be able to achieve a gig of sustained throughput. And there was a lot of education required for our customers here. And we would reverse engineer whenever anything went wrong. And we had to learn to because we very rarely had vendor support for any of our equipment. 
Finally, our out-of-band network was really interesting. One of the biggest banes of everyone's life is finding good out-of-band that actually works when you need it. And you know, we've worked at many networks that just has in-band. But we had 96 pairs of fiber on every path. So it was relatively easy to peel off one pair of fiber per path and actually build our own separate backbone network just for out-of-band. So we used a series of Cisco 1811s and media converters and built this routed network that allowed us to access the video cameras and the management interfaces of every piece of equipment in every pop. So this is one of the things we did really, really well. So finally, we actually managed to make do with what we had and fundamentally changed New Zealand's telco in, um, industry. We brought, we brought the price down to probably about a tenth of what it was and enabled a lot of ISPs to go and actually sell affordable, high-speed services to their customers. We built this network on 1 million and ultimately in 2014 sold it for $116 million to focus. Thank you. Any questions for Tim? Any questions for Tim? No? Okay, thanks Tim. Cool, thank you.